Hello, health champions. Today, I'm going to talk about a keto gone wrong video. A mom tried keto diet for 30 days. It was a little disturbing to me, this video, because I think it portrays things very distorted. Uh, so we're going to watch some clips together. I'm going to make some comments, but then I also want to give you the bigger picture and tie it together for you. So make sure you stay to the end so that you can tell for yourself if keto was the villain or the hero. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. A mom tried keto diet for 30 days. Things went wrong for her just weeks after starting it. This is what happened to her pancreas. Very dramatic opening. Here is what happened to her pancreas. So apparently the keto diet can do things to your pancreas. One day at breakfast, JC's husband noticed her repeatedly pour water from one bottle to another and back while quietly growling to herself. When asked about this after eating, she had no memory of breakfast. Okay, so this is really erratic behavior and a complete memory loss, having no recollection of what she had done, it's definitely not normal. If the keto was causing this, then we would see a lot of strange behavior in people who were doing keto. At the doctor's office days later, JC was diagnosed with postpartum depression. These changes in her body are normal. She just had a baby. Shifts in hormones and increased sensitivity to these changes can affect anyone. Postpartum depression, all right? It is not normal. It cannot happen to anybody. Memory loss and really erratic behavior, there's more going on here than just postpartum depression. JC was feeding her daughter. Human milk incorporates 50 grams of sugar per day. If she's not eating those sugars because of her keto diet, this could be a problem. Proteins and fats can be converted to sugar for use in milk, but that conversion doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen easily, and it might not be enough to keep up with JC's lactation. This can be problematic if it causes blood sugar levels to become too low. So this is an interesting point that lactation does require some sugar. But it doesn't mean that you have to eat sugar the way he said if you don't eat the sugar then you're going to be missing it that's not how it works because your body has a lot of reserves it can get sugar it can create carbohydrate through glycogenesis from both protein and from the glycerol in fat another thing that happens is that if you're in ketosis when you're breastfeeding, which actually a lot of women are these days and they're doing just fine, then because some of the sugar goes into the milk, then it's actually easier to get into ketosis when you're breastfeeding. So you may not have to be as strict with your ketogenic diet. You might, if your normal dose of carbohydrate, if your normal limit was maybe 20 grams to stay in ketosis. When you're breastfeeding, you could probably get the same level of ketosis at maybe 35 or 40 grams. So the thing to understand though is that the body has certain mechanisms to compensate for that fact. And if we think back historically, then humans didn't always have a bunch of carbohydrates and somehow the kids made it through and the mothers made it through and the norm back then was to breastfeed a whole lot longer than we do today because they didn't have any baby food. A blood, blood test, test at that, that visit revealed severe, severe hypoglycemia. So severe hypoglycemia, when you start talking neurological disruption and memory loss, I'm thinking we got glycemic levels, we got blood sugar levels probably in the 40s or even 30s. And Lactation and keto is not going to bring them that low. We already know that there's, there's got to be something else going on here. The brain uses sugar as its most immediate energy source. When sugar is suddenly low in the body, this will cause mental status changes and mood swings as the brain's energy supply is disrupted. And when combined with postpartum depression, then this explains everything that's happening to JC. So when he says that her circumstances explained all these behaviors that is just not true 
it does not explain memory loss and erratic behavior. It could explain a little bit of weakness or getting the blood sugar maybe down into the 60s, but what's going on here is not explained by those factors. And I'm not suggesting that breastfeeding is optimal on a ketogenic diet, but it has happened and these people still made it through with nothing close to these symptoms. She was sent home with medicines. She was given advice to stop the strict keto diet so long as she was still feeding her daughter. So she's sent home with medication, meaning antidepressants for her postpartum depression, as if that was the main problem, right? They diagnosed extreme severe hypoglycemia but they still haven't measured a1c they haven't measured ketones you would think maybe on a ketogenic diet that they would think to measure ketones just to see what's going on they haven't measured insulin or they haven't measured c-reactive protein these are very very simple basic inexpensive tests but they measured glucose, they diagnosed postpartum, and they sent her home with antidepressants. One morning, JC got out of bed. She laid on the floor, arms raised. She was conscious, but not responsive. She was speaking, but incoherent. She rolled over on her side and began to seize as 911 was called, and she's brought to the emergency room where we are now. A blood test again reveals hypoglycemia, but this time less than half the lower limit of normal. The medical team administers a sugar water mixture intravenously to JC. Her consciousness improves in minutes. All other signs and exams return normal as she appears to be her normal self. More tests are done on her and it's found that nothing is wrong with her kidneys, liver, and heart. Overall, it looks like nothing ever happened. She's admitted into the hospital because even if she looks okay, something is clearly amiss. All right, so we think blood sugar, and they've already measured extremely low blood sugar. And this time they're saying that it's less than half the lower normal limit, which means if lower normal is about 80, then we're now talking that she's in the 30s, all right? So if blood sugar is that unstable, if blood sugar goes that low, it's either because insulin is sky high or because the liver is completely shot and unable to produce any form of glucose. And then they mention that they've checked the other organs. They've checked the liver and the kidneys and the heart and there's nothing wrong there. So now we know that it's a blood sugar issue. So here's what's disturbing. They still don't measure A1C or ketones or insulin. The next morning, the medical team on rounds finds JC on the floor again, arms raised, this time unresponsive but conscious, incoherent but still speaking as she rolls over and starts seizing again. Doctors order another test for her blood sugar, severe hypoglycemia found again. Another glucose IV was infused into her. JC is conscious, coherent, and oriented again with no recollection at all of what just happened so now, even though she's admitted to the hospital and they know that she's severely hypoglycemic, they still find her on the floor and the same exact pattern repeats that her, she's extremely hypoglycemic, but they give her some sugar and she's back as if nothing ever happened. But they still do not measure any ketones or any A1C or any insulin, even though it is so clearly spelled out at this point that it is a blood sugar issue. And I wonder how much money they've spent on her already and they're not spending 20 bucks to run those blood tests. The medical team orders JC to fast for 72 hours. Over these three days, they will monitor her blood sugar and ketones. Things seem to be going well a couple hours into the fast. But at the seven hour mark, JC started slurring her speech. She was no longer oriented again as she lay on the floor, her arms up in the air. On measurement of her blood glucose, the results returned less than half the lower limit of normal. Ketones, which should be high, were virtually absent. So finally, they're thinking a little bit further and they're having her start a 72 hour fast. And it's very doubtful that she would make it very far into that since she's so extremely hypoglycemic. And sure enough, she makes it just a few hours in before she has another seizure and another neurological episode. 
but at least this time they think to measure the ketones. And there are two reasons why she should have very, very high ketones because she is very hypoglycemic and then the body is looking for another source of fuel. So when sugar isn't available, the body should start burning fat and a byproduct of that fat burning is ketones. The other reason is that she's also been breastfeeding. So that should take some more carbs out and have a tendency to increase the ketones further. So they would expect to find very high ketones, but they find the ketones are almost zero. So at this point, it's pretty much a locked and shut case. Cancer from somewhere else in her body that has spread to the pancreas, or it could be a functional neuroendocrine tumor, something that releases hormones inappropriately. The extreme hypoglycemia, the regular pattern of neuroglycopenic symptoms, the resolution of her mental status after the correction of her blood sugar. The medical team makes a clinical diagnosis of insulinoma. So now after we've seen 50 different examples of how traumatizing and how dangerous a ketogenic diet can be, you end up in the hospital, you have seizures, and it goes on and on and on. He spent minutes and minutes and minutes giving us examples of this, and then he spends a few seconds telling us that, oh, by the way, it was an insulinoma and they took her in for surgery. So here's the issue that I have with the video is the format that it's over dramatizing. It is attempting to be shocking rather than educational. And in doing that, in spending 95 to 98 percent of the emphasis on all the things that can go wrong, that's the impression that people leave with. If they are paying close enough attention to even hear what the solution is, otherwise they're just totally scared out of their wits about the ketogenic diet. So in doing the format that way, I feel that it's very, very misleading. And when you scare people about something that can be very helpful, then you're hurting people. The other thing that bothers me is the medical management that if they had even some basic understanding of the dynamics of blood sugar and insulin and ketones, then none of this would have ever happened. And not only the medical profession, but the people themselves. As we go into this now, the medical professionals, they're supposed to know better. But even as individuals, we can run a few of these tests and just to make sure that the changes that we're seeing are according to plan. So he said that it's an insulinoma. Now let's talk about what that is. It's a neuroendocrine tumor and it can teach us a lot. Once we start understanding a few different scenarios with these different variables, the glucose, the insulin and, and the ketones, then we can start understanding patterns because this is yet one other pattern that is just really extreme that it shows up so clearly once we know what to look for. So neuroendocrine tumor is basically just like any cell in your body can have a mutation and start dividing and growing uncontrollably. This can also happen in the very cells in the pancreas, in the beta cells. If one of the insulin producing cells get a mutation, then it could start dividing uncontrollably, but still have the ability to produce insulin. And now it is completely outside of the body's control. It's just pumping out insulin no matter what. It's not part of the normal feedback mechanism. It's the cells have gone rogue. And let's take a look at, at some of these patterns. So if we start with the blue here. This is normal glucose. So I'm going to take an example of a healthy person. This would be someone who is insulin sensitive, but who is not currently on keto. So this would be a normal blood sugar. So let's call that maybe 90. Now, if you do keto, now you're cutting back the carbs and the body is producing more ketones. So the blood sugar doesn't have to be as high. So once we're kind of established in keto and we've reversed insulin resistance, we would expect 
glucose to be a little bit lower. So if it's 90 here, this would probably be 75 or 80. Then when we look at type 2 diabetes, these are obviously people who have lost control over their blood sugar. So it could be anywhere from 130, 150, 180. And if it's not controlled very well, it could be 2 and 3 and 4 and 500 milligrams as well. So that range it could be huge depending on how well it's managed. Then we look at type 1 diabetes. And now the blood glucose is completely uncontrolled because everything they eat becomes blood sugar but there's nothing there is no insulin they've lost the ability to make any kind of insulin so the only way for their bodies to get rid of glucose is through the kidneys it ends up in the urine so their uncontrolled type 1 diabetes unmanaged type 1 diabetes so this would be really sick people who haven't found out that they have it yet or doesn't have access to some insulin. This insulin could be hundreds or could get up many, many hundreds, even a thousand milligrams per deciliter if the kidneys can't filter out the excess sugar fast enough. But as we heard in the video, the with an insulinoma, a lot of these people will have a fasting glucose or even not even fasting it could happen within hours because they have so much insulin that's just pushing that blood sugar down that they'll be in the 30s often and 30s is extremely dangerous for the brain okay this that this can kill people so it's very very important that we find these things as early as possible but then let's look at some other variables so the glucose was the only thing that they measured. But what if they had just measured one more thing? What if they had just measured ketones, all right? So in a healthy, non-keto person, that the ketones would be very low. They would be 0. Point something, 0. 0.1, 0. 0.3, somewhere around there. In a person doing keto who is in a stable nutritional ketosis, those ketones would probably be one point something up to three point something. Unless you're doing a longer extended fast, then they could go a little bit higher still. A type 2 diabetic, they will have very, very low ketones because the insulin is going to prevent the fat burning that results in ketones. A type 1 diabetic has zero insulin, so their ketones are going to be sky high. And this is what's called ketoacidosis. This is not nutritional ketosis. This is a pathological, life-threatening conditions where their ketones go five, sometimes ten times higher than you could ever get in a healthy state if you have any kind of insulin present. Now, if they had measured this earlier, they said when they measured it, they expected to see significant ketones and they were almost zero. This would have been a dead giveaway very, very early on. And this is something that a person can do for themselves. You can buy a very, very inexpensive blood meter and you can measure the glucose and the ketones. And you would have known, you would have known days into the process, you would have found this out. Now let's look at the last piece here that they also didn't measure. And this you can't do for yourself, but a lab can do it very inexpensively, and that's insulin. So in a healthy person, the glucose and the insulin are gonna be relatively balanced. And if you do keto, your insulin is gonna be a little bit lower than if you eat more carbs, but if you take it while you're fasted, then they're gonna be similar for the most part. Again, a type two diabetic is someone who's insulin resistant because their insulin is so high. So we expect that to be three to five to eight, sometimes even 10 times higher than a healthy normal person. Again, a type one diabetic has zero. We're not even putting any amount at all because their pancreas, the cells have died. They have no capacity to make insulin. Whereas an insulinoma, like we said, it's gonna pump out 
insulin regardless. No feedback mechanism, no, no paying attention to anything else going on in the body. It's just going to crank out that insulin as fast as it can produce it. So that insulin is going to be sky high. It's going to run probably 20, 30, 40 times higher than a healthy fasting level. So these are kind of the opposites of each other. One has super high ketones and no insulin and the other has no ketones and super high insulin. So if we understand these different scenarios, if we just have a very basic understanding of these mechanics, then we can understand a whole bunch of scenarios much, much easier. And if the people in the ER had known any of this, they would have tested at least ketones and insulin on the first visit. And when you found that level of hypoglycemia, then you would have had those tests performed. But I think a lot of the resistance to the ketogenic diet is that they don't understand these basic mechanics. This is described in several case reports of insulinoma diagnosed during pregnancy. So here we get a screenshot of some of the research that this, even though it is a rare phenomenon, it is very well known. But I want you to really pay attention to the item right after that he stopped highlighting. And it says, misdiagnosis has been fatal. Meaning, if you don't find this in time, if you don't address it properly, these people can die. All right? So even though this particular video points to keto as a problem, as something that can create all these different issues of seizures and so forth. I want to take a quick look at another paper that has a different perspective. So this is a very similar case that was published in the Journal of the Endocrine Society. It doesn't say here's what went wrong. They say ketogenic diet unmasking a case of insulinoma. Right, so it helped reveal it. And they're saying about insulinomas that they are a rare sporadic neuroendocrine tumor. There's about four cases per million people. And it's often difficult to diagnose given the presentation of vague symptoms. Again, why you want to measure some of these very basic markers. But the biggest reason that the symptoms are so vague is that we have an unlimited access to carbohydrates. So these people, they have so much insulin that keeps pushing the blood sugar down that they have these enormous cravings. And it doesn't take them very long to get extremely morbidly obese because their bodies are not burning any fat. They're, whatever they're eating, their bodies are storing due to all that insulin. And because the insulin is pushing down their blood sugar, they have to eat carbs just to stay alive. I mean, they, their blood sugar would go so low that they'd eventually die if they didn't get those, that glucose. And in this case, they actually measured some things when a guy came into the emergency room. They measured his A1C and it was 4.8, right? Someone who's obese and looks like a type 2 diabetic is not going to have an A1C of 4.8. That's someone who is extremely lean, extremely insulin sensitive, and who has very, very low blood sugar throughout the day. They're going to come in with 4.8 unless they have an insulinoma that keeps pushing the blood sugar down. So this guy, his fasting glucose was 30 milligrams per deciliter. That's if they're even awake, if they are not having seizures and are unconscious, then they're, they're about to. And this person's corresponding insulin level was 87.9. Okay, a healthy level is between three and five. So pretty much the same thing happened. He was very, very hypoglycemic, so they gave him some sugar and then he perked right back up. They started a 72 hour fasting test and two hours into that test, he had a glucose level of 38. Again, less than half of the lower level of normal. And his insulin, again, was 76. So about 25 times the normal level. And they continue, even though the biochemical diagnosis of an insulinoma is straightforward, just like we've talked about, it's very, very straightforward if you actually measure something. 
There is a median duration, the average duration of symptoms prior to diagnosis is about a year and a half due to the very often non-specific presentation. And again, it's non-specific because we have access to a lot of carbohydrates. But if we go on a ketogenic diet, then we're going to unmask it very quickly. But rather than unmasking it quickly, why don't we measure a few things to see if we are following anywhere near a normal pattern. And here's the conclusion of, of this paper. They say it's unclear how long our patient had an insulinoma or when it would have been discovered had he not started the ketogenic diet. We believe his decision to begin the ketogenic diet directly led to the rapid diagnosis of his tumor, which means they found it earlier before it got even more serious. And just like he showed in his paper right after his quote was that misdiagnosis has been fatal. So again, my issue with the video is that it portrayed the ketogenic diet as the initiator of all these problems when in effect, the ketogenic diet may actually have saved this woman's life. So the moral of the story is that the ketogenic diet was not the villain, but if anything, it was more so the hero. And if we just measure a few little things, and most of these things you can measure for yourself very inexpensively, then you can know if what you're doing is having a normal expected result, or if there's something totally abnormal going on that you wanna seek some help for. If you enjoyed this video, make sure that you take a look at that one. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.